inspiration's a funny thing. I mean, there you are idly going about your day, eating a banana, and boom, some amazing revelation hits you. How fitting is it that all of the technological advances we've had over the past 40 years have been because of these sort of crazy, amazing inspirational thoughts? Uh, take Burroughs' Wheeler Transform, for example. Uh, it's a very common compression algorithm for uh, Linux and uh, the web, but even the authors themselves will admit that they don't fully understand how they came up with the algorithm itself. Huh, that's the trick with inspiration, I suppose. Uh, you get greatness from nothingness. But that doesn't really help you if you want to implement the algorithm itself. Hmm. But fear not, young programmer. I'm here to help. My name is Colt McCandless, and this is Compressor Head. One of the funny things about information theory is that whole theory part. See, there's some interesting points about the theory that don't always work out right. Uh, take entropy, for example, which generally measures the information content of a data set given in bits. But one of the issues with uh, entropy is that it fails to take into account the order of the symbols. Uh, see, regardless of how I shuffle this data set of 0 through 9 here, it will always have an entropy of four. But if you've been watching the rest of our shows, you know that order does in fact matter. Take uh, delta coding, for example. If we have this variation of our data set, we can see that the delta encoded version really doesn't provide us with any lower entropy. However, if we sort this data set, giving us the nice linear number range from 0 to 9, the delta encoded version produces a much lower entropy than the source stream. Now, in an ideal world, we'd be able to just apply this type of sort to all of our data and end up with a perfectly compressible stream. But that's not actually how it works. See, pure sorts are generally one directional. That is, once you sort it, you can't get it back in its original order without a whole ton of extra data to tell you where everything goes. So we can't purely sort it, but we can get close. See, the Burroughs Wheeler Transform, or a BWT, will shuffle around the data to cluster together groups of the same symbol as much as it possibly can. The benefit of this is that once the symbols have been clustered together, they effectively have an, uh, an ordering, which can make it more compressible for other algorithms that can take advantage of it. Now remember, this, uh, this isn't a perfect sorting algorithm. It's, it's more of a uh, rough clustering algorithm. Well, technically, it's a, it's a lexicographical permutation. You know what? <laughs> Anyhow, the point is that BWT has one amazing characteristic. We can encode to and decode from BWT without having to add any significant additional data to our stream. Let's take a look. Go! Whoa! Do we want him talking? The transform part of Burroughs Wheeler Transform starts by creating a table of shifted permutations for your input stream. Uh, so let's take the word banana as an example and write that in the first row of our table. Now on each row under that, let's do a rotational shift of that word to the right, one character. Uh, that is, all of the letters in our string shift to the right and the frontmost character gets pushed onto the back. We do this for each symbol in our stream, rotating one character to the right, so we end up with a table whose number of rows equals the length of the stream. The next step is to sort the rows of this table lexicographically, giving us a sorted table form. Now, this is where some of the dark magic happens. You can see that each row is effectively a permutation of the word banana, but also each column is a permutation as well. Uh, the first column, of course, is the sorted permutation of our word. But it really, what we want is the last column in general. This N-N-B-A-A-A has some interesting characteristics. Notice it's got better symbol clustering than any of the other columns, especially our input stream, and thus is what we output as our encode. Now, before you run off, there's one other piece of data that we need to grab as well. Notice that in our sorted table, the input string actually sits at index 4. We'll need this row index during the decode phase of the Burroughs Wheeler transform because it will allow us to move from our more compressible permutation back to the source string. Now, you may ask yourself, why do we choose this last column? I mean, the one right next to it seems uh, just as good, seems to have very close clustering. Why not that one? 
Well, this is more BWT magic. See, this last column has an interesting feature. If we have only this, uh, N, N, B, A, 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 we can recover the rest of our sorted table entirely. Uh, the other columns don't possess this same characteristic, which is highly important when we're trying to invert our transform. Banana. That's great! All right. The remarkable thing about Burroughs Wheeler Transform is not that it generates a more compressible output, uh, any ordinary sort would do that, but that this particular transform is reversible with minimal data overhead. And to help us demonstrate that is my good friend Magnus, who uh, turns out is training yeah. for the World Sorting Championship. Yeah, is sorting is my thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this guy right here, he's gonna take it all. All right. So at the start of our decode step, we're given the string NNBAAA and the row index of four. If you recall, NNBAAA represents the last column of our table. So uh, Magnus, can you put an NNBAAA up on the board for us? Like that? Just like that. Great! Do it! Now when he's doing this, I want you to watch his technique. Watch the way his hand flows through the process. Yeah! Finished! Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Young kids, be afraid of this guy. Now, once we have this data in our table, the next step is to sort it, which is uh, where Magnus comes in for us. All right, Magnus, you ready? Absolutely. We're gonna do a sort, nice warm up, don't pull anything. Okay. All right, when you're ready, go. Excellent, good job, great form, nice. Remember, clench those abs. Yeah, good, stay with it, fantastic. All right, ha <laughs> It's good, it's good, all right. Now that we've got a sorted table, the next step is to prepend the input string again. So Magnus, another NNBAAA, please. Over there? Right there. Great, man. This guy gets it, right? Good, good. Nice, nice. Bah. Now, all right, now that it's there, we gotta do another sort. A sort? Another sort. Okay. All right, now I'm gonna time this one. Okay. This is gonna be a good warm up round. Yeah. All right, ready? When yeah. you're ready, three, two, one, Go. Okay, let's right, go. Good. Now remember, you gotta tighten your abs during the sort. They're gonna, you're gonna be judged on speed and accuracy here. Boom! Fantastic. Look at that, 11 seconds. Yeah! That's a personal best for this guy. Wow! You're already sorting faster than Michael Phelps. That's great to know. I agree. So this is how the BWT decode works. We append our input string across the rows of our input table, then sort, and then continue on until we've recovered our original matrix. So Magnus, you ready yeah. for the big one? Yeah, yeah. All right, so here's what we're gonna do, okay? We're gonna do this four more times. Four? So we've got six letters in each row. Wow! You think you can do it? Yeah! Are you ready to do it? I'm ready, ready, ready! This is for the world championship! Yeah, man, right. let's do it! Ready? Yeah! Set, go! All right, good, great, good job, good job, N-N-B-A-A-A. We're gonna get you so many endorsements. You're almost there, Magnus. Finish strong, finish strong. Oh, man, great job, kid. All right, all right, all right. Calm down, why don't you hit the showers and I'll walk the people through the rest of the algorithm, all right? Good job today, good job. I don't think he's uh, got a shot at that one. Anyhow. Thanks to Magnus, we've got a recreated permutation table alongside a nifty row index that we output during the encoding phase. Uh, since this matrix over there is identical to the post-sorted one from the encoder, the fourth row actually contains the original input string, banana. See? Pretty easy stuff. Oh, and to be clear, kids, training to be a world champion at sorting requires a lot of practice and dedication. So eat your vegetables and listen to your parents. How do you make your hair do that? Lots and lots of gel. Really? I'm jealous. Not just because it's a pun. Thanks. Take him a second. In 1994, Mike Burroughs and David Wheeler were set up to be the title fight at the second annual UFC championship in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, but before the fight, while playing a few rounds of Pi Gao, the two ended up creating the Burroughs Wheeler Transform algorithm. That isn't really true. No, no, no it is not. Um, huh, you know, one of the problems about working at Google is you can't really throw a stone around here without hitting the inventor of some amazing algorithm. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to the co-inventor of the Burroughs Wheeler Transform, Mr. Mike Burroughs. Uh, Mike, it's fantastic to see you. Uh, maybe if you have a second, can you uh, sit down and talk to us a little bit about your algorithm? Certainly. <sighs> I'd like to put you straight about that title fight. <laughs> okay, um, so... Uh, I guess at the beginning, let's start there. Well, it really started with David Wheeler. Um, 
He was on the faculty at the University of Cambridge, but on sabbatical at Bell Labs and working on compression, and he came up with the algorithm there. I only learned about it some years later when I became his graduate student. In the world of data compression, like Burroughs Wheeler Transform just stands alone against everything else. There's nothing really like it. How did you all come up with it? Well, I asked David what was going through his mind when he came up with it originally, and he didn't know. He could not explain to me how he came up with that particular algorithm. I got the impression that he was playing around with sorting the contexts of characters that were to be encoded and uh, using that as a good predictor. And then he must have realized that it was possible to invert that sort under certain conditions. Did you and Mike kind of co-create the article together? I mean, was it, was it more of his idea and kind of he handed off to you? How did that relationship work? What happened was that uh, he never bothered writing it up. I learned about it from him as a graduate student and uh, the years ticked by after that and he never wrote it up. At the time, when I was a student, I thought that it was just one of those things that grad students learn. <laughs> and then eventually I realized, no, this was really special, and the world ought to know about it. When he did it, he did not think of it as a practical algorithm. He thought of it as an algorithm to use to calibrate other algorithms. It wasn't practical for him because he didn't have a really fast implementation, and uh, computers at the time were significantly slower, and so it uh, didn't really go fast enough. So I decided that what I should do is write it up myself. And in order to do that, uh, I had to do something. And so I worked with him to make it go fast. And we came up with ways to implement it efficiently. Well, so I got to ask you, I mean, in the 20 years since this algorithm's invention, what has been the most amazing thing you've seen it applied for? I mean, it's been everywhere from uh, the Linux operating system to, you know, uh, a protocol on the internet. Uh, what's, what's impressed you so much about its use so far? Well, I suppose the most unexpected thing has been its use in DNA sequencing. Huh. It puts together the uh, fragments of DNA that have been sequenced independently very efficiently into a combined whole. Hmm. Um, but there have been many other advances around it, particularly in uh, ways to do the sorting efficiently. Um, also variants of the transform, uh, one that sorts only limited length contexts. It turns out that Michael Schindler of the Technical University of Vienna discovered that if you sort the contexts up to any finite length k, it's still invertible as a transform. Unfortunately, the inversion takes twice as long, so it's not popular, but it still works. David Scott and Yossi Azar managed to uh, find a bijective variant of the transform where the size of the transformed string is exactly the same as the size of the input string. Oh, so you don't like need the row index at the end. Yes, that's correct. It's a bit more involved and a bit slower to do the compression, but it still works. Um, and that was another surprise for me. Give me a little bit of background here. Uh, where did you actually publish the paper originally for this? There's a funny story about that. We first of all sent the paper to the annual data compression conference, but they rejected it. Um, and there were no comments about why they rejected it. So I wrote to them and asked why they had rejected it. And they told me that it was, was their policy not to explain why they rejected papers. So uh, we just published it as a technical report the next year, uh, people at the same conference actually asked me to submit the paper again so that they could publish it. And I said no, and I wasn't really going to explain why because it was my policy not to explain that sort of thing. <laughs> so the algorithm actually became uh, more well known when someone else who saw the technical report published a popular article about it in Dr. Dobbs' journal. So that was the first real publication uh, where people got to know about it. Wow, so just completely bypass the academic route uh, and you know, go for mainstream media. That's, that's how we get our algorithms out nowadays, right? That's the way it worked. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, Mike, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us a bit uh, about this algorithm. We're, we're really honored to have you here. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, I felt, given the state of the other Compressor Head episodes, that I ought to come along personally and fix things. <laughs> okay, uh, well, thank you for that. Um, you, you sure did. Thank you. Okay.
what's on me. Huh. I was just texting my boss. So it's apparent that BWT doesn't actually compress the data. It uh, just transforms it. To practically use BWT, we need some way to apply another transform that's going to yield a stream which has lower entropy and thus is more compressible. Uh, good old delta compression doesn't really help us that much. Encoding our post BWT stream of N N B A A A yields us the version of the string. Uh, this whole thing, which has an entropy of 1.77, while the source entropy itself is only 1.45. Uh, we haven't actually improved anything. No, for this type of data, we need a different type of transform, which is better suited for the type of symbol clustering that BWT produces. We call this move to front encoding. Effectively, start by creating a buffer that contains all the unique symbols that your stream could have and list them in a sorted order. Uh, for our purposes, we'll just use the English alphabet. The move to front algorithm is pretty simple. Uh, for each symbol we read, we write its output buffer position and then move it to the front of our buffer. Now, for example, if we input the letter N, that sits at position 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So we write that to our output stream. The next step is how the algorithm gets its name. Once we've written its out position, we then move that symbol to the front of the buffer. Time to read in the next symbol, which is also N. Since that's already at the front of our stream, we write a 1 to the output stream. This is the trick of the transform. The idea is that since BWT clusters symbols together, there's a high probability that subsequent copies of that symbol will appear in the stream after we've encountered the first one. So we end up outputting more 1s as a result. Uh, let's take a look at the rest of the encoding. Let's read B onto the stream, and as such, we output the index 3 because that's where it sits in the buffer and move it to the front. We next read A and output the index of 3 again, since here it sits once more. Let me just fix that. Now, the next two A's that we read from the stream won't adjust any part of the buffer since A already sits in the first position. As such, we simply emit 1's to the output stream. Hmm. Now, after encoding, the output stream here is 1413311, whose entropy is 1.45, which is identical to our source input stream. Eh, pretty good. From here, you can simply throw the output of move to front to any statistical compressor, uh, like Huffman or arithmetic compression. Uh, in fact, bzip2, the popular Linux compression application, couples Burroughs Wheeler transform plus move to front plus arithmetic compression for its exact algorithm. You're looking at the inner workings of science here, folks. That's an interesting thing to say. Like, that was just really cool to hear. Yeah. Anyway. All right, all right yeah, sorry. Should... We could do this all day. What's amazing about Burroughs Wheeler Transform is that it stands alone as a compression algorithm. Uh, LZ, Huffman, Arithmetic, they all have tons of variants and have been worked on by tons of different people. In the last 20 years, Burroughs Wheeler Transform has gotten much less attention. But that doesn't mean it's any less useful. Uh, in recent competitions to compress human DNA sequences, BWT-based compressors were all in the top 10 finalists. And as far as the compression world goes, there's still plenty left to improve upon here. But that's a topic for a different show. My name is Colvin Canlis. Thanks for watching.